This video is an excerpt from a much longer Italy travel talk. To view other topics or to watch my Italy talk in its entirety, visit ricksteves.com or check out my Rick Steves YouTube channel. Enjoy. Buongiorno, I'm Rick Steves. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us. I'm telling you, Italy is my favorite country. It's about the two thirds the size of California, 60 million people, and we can think of it in terms of regions. And often overlooked are the charms of Northern Italy. In the north of Italy, we've got beautiful Riviera ports, we've got romantic lakes, we've got the most important big city to see in the sense of today's energy of Italy, that would be Milano, and we've got the mountains, the Alps of Italy, the Dolomite. We'll start with the Cinque Terre, because a lot of people are dreaming of the Italian Riviera when they dream about Italy. I love the Cinque Terre. I think if there's any place I've had an impact on more than other places in my travel writing is the Cinque Terre. I discovered that back when I was a college kid, and I just have done my very best to ruin it. I mean, there are so many tourists there now, and uh, when I discovered it, there was no economy there. It was very poor. It was probably one of the poorest parts of Italy, and since then, it has developed. It has welcomed the tourists, and I was joking about me. I think everybody is getting on board, and people are recognizing the charm of these little villages, and today, you've got five incredible little Towns, all within easy walking distance of each other, just an hour or two away from big places like Genoa, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and Florence. When you go to the Cinque Terre, there's five towns. That's what it means, Cinque Terre, the five lands. And uh, Monte Rosa al Mare is the town that is the best resort town of the region. That's where you'll find the most hotels, the nicest beaches, and so on. And when we go to Monte Rosa al Mare, you've got that rent an umbrella kind of ambience on the beach, and the only really good beach on the Cinque Terre. And I'll remind you, in the evening, that's when the crowds go home, and that's where the charm comes out. The Cinque Cinque Terre used to be the classic back door. Uh, there's nothing really back door about it now. It is mobbed with visitors in the middle of the day. They're not only the tourists like you and me, they're the cruisers that come in, and there are the people side tripping in from the big city, Genoa. Genoa is a huge city, and there's a lot of people there that just want to scoot over to the beaches for a little fun. Consequently, during the day, the towns are just inundated, but at night, everybody's away. There's not enough comfortable hotels in these areas to keep mass tourism happy, so people do not spend the night. It's all yours at night. That's the good news. My favorite town is Vernazza. And Vernazza is the most exotic town, it's the most romantic town, it's the most kind of dramatic town. Vernazza, and you got beautiful views coming in from either direction, is what I would try to stay at, but it's hard to get a room there, you need to book it in advance, and you pay a little extra money, I think, to stay in Vernazza. But look at Vernazza, it's perfectly preserved. Nobody has any modern buildings there. It hasn't changed a bit. It's a national park. The whole area is a national park. This is frustrating if you're a local landowner because you can't meet the demand by upgrading your funky little pension into a fancy hotel and charge more money. There are no comfortable hotels in this town because nobody can build a comfortable hotel, and that's really good news because it keeps away the most obnoxious slice of the traveling public, people who insist on good hotels. They're all in Portofino nearby, or Porto Venere, complaining about the prices and the traffic jams. What I like about the Cinque Terre in part is, it is fiat-free Italy. There's 60 million people in Italy, and just as many fiats, and I, I find my favorite places are places that are essentially traffic-free. It's hard to get a car to these little chunks of the Riviera coast. I've seen a lot of the Riviera. This is my favorite little bit of the, Rivi of the Mediterranean coast anywhere. Vernazza. At night, all the, the restaurants are busy, and, and anybody who's uh, spending the night in the region is enjoying some beautiful, fresh seafood. The people are proud of their cooking. There's a lot of local traditions there. Uh, pesto and trophy. Trophy is a special kind of pasta made for the pesto, this beautiful basil sauce, and it is, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, harvested right there, and it is famous for that region. It's called Liguria. And of course, the seafood is a big deal in the Cinque Terre. You get some beautiful seafood, some beautiful pasta, and some delightful memories when you're eating in the romantic evening hours with a good perch with a view of the sea when you are in the Cinque Terre. Or, uh, Vernazza is a beautiful place to call home. Now, you can walk from town to town to town. Here, you can see the kind of coastline, and you can imagine what the trails are like. The only town of the five that's not on the water is Cornelia. 
and to get to Cornelia, you got to hike up from the water, and uh, there's switchbacks from the train station as part of the Cinque Terre uh, trail, and uh, after Cornelia, you'll come to a town called Manarola, and Manarola is a secondary town. It's got a lot of charm, but it doesn't have the exotic beauty of Vernazza. Still, it's a great stop. This is a view of Manarola from the boat out at sea, and the big town of the Cinque Terre is Rio Maggiore. And Rio Maggiore is a nice place that would be a little less touristed than Vernazza and still have the magic of the Cinque Terre. Here we have another view of Rio Maggiore. Now the trains laced together each of these towns, and the trains didn't come in until about a century ago, after the unification of Italy. So that's one reason they're so uh, remote and so exotic and, and, and distant feeling, is the modern world was not able to get there until the last century. In fact, the towns originated as uh, groups of people kind of hiding out from marauding pirates. People chose the most rugged part of the Italian coastline, and each of these towns has a castle where they would have a lookout and they would holler if the pirates were coming. Today, of course, the trains are tunneling through, and the trains are in the tunnels, and then they just blink open for each of the dazzling, colorful ports, and then you're back in the darkness. And uh, it's the way you connect the towns. Every hour there is a train, and about every hour in the summer when the weather's good and it's not too windy, there's a boat. And the boats go from town to town, and they always feel like uh, injecting economy into the towns when they stick their little bows there and all the people empty into the town, and they scurry around, do their shopping, and then get back onto the boat and go to the next stop. It's easy to get from town to town, but in the Cinque Terre, a departure in the hand is worth two around the corner. So if you've got a train leaving right now, or if you've got a boat leaving right now, and you've got to get somewhere, it's best to get on that, because you never know when the trains are going to just stop running, or the boats are going to in incur too much wind to be able to stop in the little ports. The cruise industry is really causing a problem in the Cinque Terre. In the last few years, Livorno, which is the cruise port for Florence, has realized, the cruise ships have realized that a real attraction for their cruisers, for people who have already been to Florence, is to send them over to the Cinque Terre. Consequently, busloads of people, and I'm talking thousands, are coming in at the same time, making the trails of the Cinque Terre almost impassable. If you are on a cruise ship, I think it's, I don't think it's right to add to this scary problem of too, physically too many human beings in the Cinque Terre, but that coupled with normal weekend crowds and normal summer crowds and all of this, it's making midday on certain times when you get a perfect storm of cruise ships almost unlivable for the Cinque Terre. Remember, in the early morning, in the evening, it's relatively empty. In the middle of the day, it can be absolutely ridiculous. So take advantage of those beautiful quieter hours when you're on the Cinque Terre and enjoy the trails. The trails are a beautiful way to just get a dose of that kind of Riviera wonder. A lot of times when you're using the trails, you'll come around the corner and see just the view of a lifetime, and photographers just gobble it up. It's easy to hike from town to town, it just feels good, and when you get into town, the food, which is already delicious, tastes even better. Now, when you're planning a trip to the Cinque Terre, for a lot of travelers, there's a lot of stress relating to trail closures, and you'll hear people say, no, the trails are all closed, there was a flood, there was a landslide, the more more trails. Well, I've been going to the Cinque Terre for 30 years, and I've never been there when the trails aren't closed, you know. There's always a trail here and there that's closed. Basically, most of the trail closures are to cover their uh, legal uh, exposure. They have to say it's closed, proceed at your own risk, and then people step over the little barrier and make the walk. Uh, uh, if one trail is absolutely closed, and that does happen, and probably right now there's one or two trails that just are impassable physically, there's still a handful of other trails that are wide open. So. Don't worry about trail closures in advance. Go there regardless. You will have trails, and ask locally, not to the tourist board, because they're going to tell you the party line. Ask somebody who's not in the tourist board, really, what trails are open and where can I hike, and then make your plans from there. You'll find the main kind of accommodations in the Cinque Terre is private accommodations. The older people have moved to the big city, and they've hired East Europeans to live there in a little corner of their apartment and rent out the rest of the apartment to travelers. And it's quite handy, it's quite reasonably priced, and you're right there in that little town wonder. 
there are pebbly beaches on most of the Cinque Terre towns. If you want a serious beach, you got to go to resorts nearby. But frankly, I wouldn't go to Italy for great beaches. Uh, I would go to Italy for ba great coastal culture and so on. But leave the great beaches to the Italians. They thrive on crowds and traffic jam and noise. They actually like that. And for us, it's just stressful. We don't speak the, the language. We don't really know the ropes. I would stay away from the famous beach resorts in Italy, and I would focus on the rustic charm of the Italian Riviera and the Cinque Terre. In the north of Italy are a bunch of lakes. It's almost like the peninsula of Italy is welded to the Alps right around these lakes. There's Lago di Garda, uh, Lake Maggiore, Maggiore, and also Lake Como. My favorite of the lakes, without any doubt, is Lake Como, and that's what I stress. Lago di Como. This is called honeymoon country in Italy, uh, Luna de Mille, honeymoon country. And my favorite stop in Lago di Como is Varena. And Varena, not to be accused, uh, uh, confused with Vernazza in, in the Cinque Terre, uh, Varena is like the Vernazza of the lakes in the north of Italy. The neat thing about Varena is it's a one-hour train ride from Milano. You can fly into Milano, catch the train one hour north and not deal with the big city and get over jet lag in Varena. If I'm ever just fried, and that happens to me when I'm working sometimes, I need a place to convalesce, this is it, Varena. It is so beautiful. Get a little hotel right on the waterfront. You get a pass and you can use the ferries all over the lake. Uh, you'll find all sorts of people just having anniversaries or having honeymoons or having romantic getaways. There's something really romantic about Varena on Lago di Como. The lake is full of traditional steamers. And these steamers will connect the towns. Bellagio, you may have heard of Bellagio. Uh, this is the actual Bellagio right here. And it is the resort of the region. It's bigger than Verena. This is where well-dressed people with their little poodles go for vacation. And it's fun to drop by, although I would hang out in Verena. An hour to the south is Milano. And if you're going to see one big city, one no-nonsense, powerful city in Italy, I'd make it Milano. They say for every church in Rome, there's a bank in Milano. And uh, Milano is where you feel the energy of Italy. Recently, Italy surpassed England in per capita uh, income. And Italy is making more money per capita than in England, not because of San Gimignano and Siena and the Cinque Terre, I can promise you that. It's because of the no-nonsense powerful industrial cities of the north, Torino, Genoa, Milano, and so on. Milano is the city for me to feel the reality of Italy. You owe it to yourself to have one day or a couple of days in a great no-nonsense city. And it's a great place to fly into. Uh, it's, a, it's a great place for sightseeing. You've got this incredible Duomo. When you hear the word Duomo in Italy, that means cathedral, the Duomo. And this would be the Duomo of Milano. Milano is, like so many Italian cities, going traffic-free. Look at this beautiful uh, bike street here and pedestrian street. Just a few years ago, it was full of cars. And now it is all for the people. This is the main square, the Piazza del Duomo, looking at the cathedral. And when I'm here, I'm always thinking about the Risorgimento. Remember, in 1850, there was no Italy and there was no Germany. There was just a bunch of little countries that spoke those languages that dreamed of one day being united. The established countries in Europe wanted nothing to do with that, and it took some pretty impressive political finagling for the great George Washingtons and Thomas Jeffersons of modern Italy to get that country together. I would highly recommend learning about the Risorgimento before you go to Italy, because when you go to Italy, everywhere you look, it's Cavour that, and Mazzini this, and Garibaldi that. Those are all the heroes of the 1860s when Italy was defying the big powers of Europe and becoming united. And the hotbed of that risorgimento spirit was Milano. And when you go to Milano, it's everywhere. I mean, this is the Victor Emmanuel Gallery, a big gallery named after the first king of Italy. And it was, there, was, there was energy in Italy after 1870 when Italy united. They're building trains and lacing the other country. They're building wonderful, state-of-the-art, futuristic, uh, uh, you know, industrial age malls. And uh, they, they, they just were, were, were embracing this whole idea of Italy. Uh, the, the fathers of Italy famously said, we've created Italy. Now we need to create Italians, all right? Uh, because there was that, what they call campanilismo. In Italy, campanilismo is loyalty to your own bell tower, the campanile. 
right here in my town in Edmonds, right outside my office, there's a, a, a cute little bell tower and, a, and it rings a bell. And I've got a little bit of that campanilismo right here. Can you imagine a hundred loyalties like that all around Italy and suddenly you've got a unified political entity with 60 million people or whatever and now that challenge is to teach these people you're Italians. So it's a wonderful story and it's just 150 years old and it's worth checking out. Across the street from that Victor Emmanuel gallery you've got the La Scala Opera House, the greatest opera house in a lot of ways in Europe. And when you go there and you step inside, you go to the museum, you get a look at the opera hall, you learn about Verdi. Verdi, the great opera composer. What's his name? V-E-R-D-I. It was a political slogan. Victor Emmanuel, re d'Italia. Victor Emmanuel, the first king of Italy. People would stand on their chairs in the opera and they'd sing the arias knowing they were waving the Italian flag, which was forbidden because Austria and France wouldn't allow it. But they all work together in these wonderful, wonderful, trouble-causing, patriotic ways to somehow bring Italy to unity. To learn about that is really exciting, and you can do that when you go to Milano. When you go to Milano, a lot of people are interested in Leonardo da, uh, da Vinci's Last Supper. I'll warn you, you need a reservation. Ever since the appearance of the Da Vinci Code, there have been long lines to get in to see Leonardo's Last Supper, and you need to book it a month in advance. So get your guidebook out, get online, and make a reservation, and then it's very straightforward. But if you go to Milano and you don't have a reservation for the Last Supper, it's going to be very complicated and very expensive for you to actually get a chance to see it. It's one of the great masterpieces of European art. It's interesting to note that Leonardo chose to uh, finish his career, in most the, the meat of his career, in Milano. It was a very important city that rivaled Florence and oftentimes underappreciated. Beautiful districts to go out to eat in Milano. There's a place out in the, the canal kind of port district called the Naviglio Grande, which is where I like to go for a characteristic meal, and that would all be discussed in the Rick Steves Italy guidebook. Now, when you go to Italy, if you want the complete story of Italy, part of that is the Alps. We think of Alps being France and Switzerland and Austria, but the Dolomite, or the Dolomites, are the Italian Alps, and they really are quite impressive. Now, I want to remind you, this part of Italy was Austrian until World War I. Austria started and lost World War I, they lost their international holdings, becomes a relatively insignificant little landlocked country, and its port on the, on the Mediterranean, Trieste, and all that area around there, became part of Italy. When you go to Dolomite area now, you'll find signs in both languages, because it's just been a hundred years that people have been part of Italy, and they still speak German. Here we see the two names of the region, Sud Tyrol, if you happen to be from Vienna, and Alto Adige, if you're from Rome, okay? The South Tyrol, or the Upper Adige River Valley. And below that you see, hello, welcome, in three different languages. Welcome in German, welcome in Italian, and Welcome in the ancient Latin language that this little demographic enclave still has as a part of their language heritage. Uh, there's a tiny little group of people that still speak this language that was related directly to the ancient Latin. When we look around the Dolomite, I explored this whole area when I was writing the first edition of my Rick Steves Italy guidebook, looking for a good town to call home in the Dolomite. And most of the towns just felt like a ski resort in the summer. It just drained out and empty, and what am I doing here? It's the wrong season. But there's one place that is, well, there's a major town called Bolzano, and that would be in the valley floor. And Bolzano feels a lot like Salzburg, but in Italy, it's got beautiful arcades and a wonderful alpine kind of heritage, and a quirky museum with the Iceman, Otzi, who thawed out of a glacier, and it gives us a, like a quirky, miraculous look at somebody who lived in prehistoric times. Quite amazing to see Otzi the Iceman when you're in Bolzano. And my favorite hometown is just up on top of the ridge above Bolzano, and this town is called Castleruth. Now you'll see here it's got two names, Castleruth and Castle Roto. I happen to say the German word at first. But if you're Italian, you'd say Castle Roto. What's confusing is if you have a map, it might say either or. Bolzano would be Bozen, uh, Castle Ruth, Castle Roto. There's a town nearby, Vipetino or Sterzing. You don't know, depending on German or Italian. Castle Ruth is a charming town with a beautiful old district, chairlifts going right out from there into the mountains for lovely hikes, and always some cultural activities happening. From there, you take a shuttle bus into a national park called the Alpi di Susi.
The Alpi di Susi is the biggest high meadow in the Alps, anywhere in the Alps. And you've got this lovely high meadow on a sunny day, on a warm day. It's such a delightful hike. You can do it in a wheelchair. I mean, it's just perfectly flat. It's like pasture land. Or you can hike up and get onto the Schlern, the mountain there. Uh, it's just like going to the beach, except up in the mountains. There's petting zoos, there's lounge chairs. It is just a delightful chance for anybody to enjoy the Alps of Italy. So when you're thinking about Italy, remember, there are a lot of great attractions high up in the north. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this video, you'll find lots more at ricksteves.com and on my Rick Steves YouTube channel. Happy travels and thanks for joining us.